Oxford philosophy professor William McCaskill has quickly become noteworthy as the guru of the effective altruism movement. This movement supposedly applies a rational, data-driven perspective to selecting the charitable causes that do the most good. In his latest book, What We Owe the Future, McCaskill claims that true effective altruists pay careful attention to the welfare of the people of the distant future. Do we have obligations to people in the distant future? Should we be concerned about the kinds of future doomsday scenarios McCaskill conjectures? Rule by artificial intelligence, global nuclear war, environmental catastrophe. What does McCaskill's latest book reveal about the core premises of the effective altruist movement and about the moral code of altruism as such? Welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today we'll discuss the topic, why William McCaskill is wrong about what we owe the future. I'm Mike Mazza, Associate Fellow at ARI. With me are Ben Bayer, ARI Fellow and Director of Content, and Don Watkins, ARI Director of Mentoring. Hi, Don. Hi, Ben. Hey, Mike. Good to be here. So uh, I think we want to start our conversation by laying out a little bit about the framework we're going to be using to evaluate McCaskill's books. A lot of the responses to his book have come from people who are sympathetic to much of his framework. So our, uh, our critique is going to be different in, in that we're um, going to cut closer to the, to the fundamentals. So um, Don, let's start with you. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about in, in what respect is it rational to care about the future? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a good starting point is like, the essential difference between our framework and the effective egoism or effective altruism framework is that ours is egoistic, right? And the basic idea there is that you are your own primary interest, that you are after your own happiness and that that's what you should be aiming at. But far from the kind of conventional idea that other people's interests are always and inherently separate from that, the people that you love and care about, their interests um, come to be part, your interests come to encompass theirs in varying degrees like the person you know the the woman that i'm in love with her interest what's good for her is an important part of what's good for me and good for my life and if you think about children it's the same thing like my i have two children livy and landon and what's good for them is like that's crucial and essential to my life and happiness and just as your own interests aren't your interests today or in the next hour or the next week but encompass your whole lifespan so my interest in my children's interest encompasses their lifespan which presumably is going to extend beyond mine so it's rational to be concerned with things beyond our life, but it's because we have a stake in things that will exist beyond our life. But it's a real question, and I'll just say, if you guys want to elaborate or, um, on it, uh, the idea that we could have an interest in things that are totally remote from our lives, such as people who are gonna get, uh, exist in a million years or a billion years, there's no basis for that, given that what gives us a stake in the future is precisely our values here in our lives today. Okay, so you mentioned, yeah. uh, Ben, did you want I was to just going to say, sorry, that um, Don, you're, you're quite right to emphasize, first of all, that uh, part of what's unconventional about our perspective here is that we, uh, we have the view that uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism has the view that the interests of other people can be an important part of our own interests. And that's part of, but not all of, what uh, makes a code of self-interest uh, relevant to a code of morality. Um, another point that's relevant is that the, uh, I mean, the kind of the stereotype that you get of egoism, of, of of concern with your own interest, is that you're interested only in the immediate moment, that you only care about the short-term gratification of your own immediate pleasures and 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 desires, and I mean, it's a it's a caricature. It's uh, in fact. You do uh, a rational person who's concerned with his own life is concerned with it in the long range over the course of his own life. That uh, that this is part of what distinguishes human life from animal life. A you know projecting uh, of the course of our life and the story of our life and who we want to become. And it's not all about the immediate short term future. And so there are definitely rational reasons to care about what are you going to do with your career and and do you what do you want to build by the time 
that you die. Uh, what do you want to, what kind of life do you want to make for yourself? A human life is not just the life of an animal living in the moment. And, um, you know, one more thing I'll, I'll add to that is that for the, the rational, the rationally self-interested person from this perspective, uh, there's even more than simply your own loved ones, uh, can be, of value to you. I mean, I think here we include even like you have reason to respect the rights of other people that you, you know, that you live in the same society with, uh, that even if you don't know them, um, they, you know, other human beings are a source of potential value for your life. They're, you know, prospective trading partners, they're prospective friends and lovers and people who you can learn things from. And that's part of the reason you, you don't not only, I mean, you have good reason to sometimes even want to help uh, not only your, your friends and loved ones, but even strangers who are in trouble through no fault of their own for these kinds of reasons, certainly no reason to, to harm them. And there's no special value that comes just from uh, destroying other people's lives for its own sake. That's, that's nihilism. That's not any kind of a concern with your interests. So yeah, there, there is a legitimate question here about, um, uh, how, how should we think about the future? And uh, the, what we're going to talk about is like how much of the future can possibly be of rational interest. Okay. So in some sense, we should care about the long term. We should care about progress. Um, what does this imply? Yeah. So uh, the start by observe. We're going to say a lot about what we think is is wrong with um, this book by McCaskill, who's, which is a, a book that's become uh, much talked about in intellectual circles in the last few months. It's, it's, it's kind of a manifesto for a whole movement. And though we're going to have a lot of things to criticize about it, I mean, I think one thing that McCaskill gets right is that if you, if you care about the future in any sense, uh, one thing you're going to look at is what kind of values are you transmitting to the future? Because values are things that get entrenched. And maybe there are periods in history that where, where certain kinds of values are more likely to get entrenched. And in future periods, it, it'll be less likely to change. Uh, I think we can even agree with him about certain, certain of the values that he thinks would be good to entrench. He mentions things like free speech and free migration, because they allow for the possibility of uh, if something goes wrong with your society, you can change it. Uh, it, it. So it makes it makes other elements of your society less entrenched, more possibly dynamic. You know, if you if you have a bad government, but you still have free speech, you can still speak up and try to change your government. Whereas if you institute censorship, um, people just w will lose access to ideas about how they could make their uh, their world better and and lose access to communicating to others about how to do the same thing. So. Uh, there is an important thing he's got his his fingers on here about uh, one of the things that has the biggest long term impact in history is whether rational or irrational values uh, are transmitted to the future. And that's so I think that's something we should certainly care about here. The question is, uh, what are the values that we think will have the most important long term impact uh, and especially for our own lives? So, um, Don, uh, you have thoughts on, on that issue? Yeah, well, I mean, just to elaborate, I think, on something you're touching on. So you, you mentioned, like, he'll raise things like free speech, but it's all with the caveat that these are not values that I'm standing behind 100%. And indeed, free speech is contingent on if we like the way that it's ending up. So there's no, what there's no discussion of is any kind of principle of freedom. And if you actually think about what allows human beings to solve problems, including the kinds of problems that are raised in this book, it is the ability to use our minds that re is one of Ayn Rand's core insights is that reason is our means of survival. It's our way of kind of solving problems and guiding ourselves through life. And then it's the fundamental fuel of progress that the way that we're driving ourselves forward is by the mind and that the, the fundamental requirement for that to happen is freedom. And so, you know, as we go along here, like from our framework, the basic question is, all right, if we have the free human mind in place, isn't that going to be enough to solve these problems? And if what McCaskill is saying is, yeah, well, we don't have to protect the free human mind. 
we can run some kind of other approach to solving problems and we can talk about what that is that makes me really really skeptical of the approach and it is it should just leap out at you how much he dances around the concept of freedom i mean even he'll hedge things like it appears that liberal democracies might be better than at, at, at you know nurturing uh, progress and attracting places than like authoritarian regimes um, and it's just so vague and apologetic on this issue. You know, we need experimentation. We need Marxism. Uh, he talks, I, I forget exactly how he puts it, but like, you know, these little trial cities where we can have Marxism in these eco societies. I don't just mean that we would protect little pockets of economic freedom. Don't, don't mistake me for somebody who's crazy about freedom. And so um, it, it's definitely, I think, dodging the question of is freedom a value and that I'm going to stand behind? Um, really, really jumped out at me reading this. And I mean, what do you think is the answer to that question, Don? I mean, is is freedom of value and, and to whom and why? Well, I mean, I tried to indicate the core reason why I think freedom is a value is because if you, I mean, just if you think about the broad swath of history, right? What, if, if reason is our tool of survival and the things that allows us to solve problems, it's the way to make that impossible. And it's when people are able to use force against one another. That is when we're free, it doesn't guarantee that we're going to think. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to use our minds. It doesn't guarantee that we're going to solve any particular problem. But it guarantees that we have the capability and possibility of doing that, whereas force takes it off the table. Yeah, and and one of the things that's that I think is really crucial about freedom is that it, it's not just a, a, a value to isolated atomistic individuals. It's it's a value to those who want to interact with each other in society uh, in order to trade um, to mutual benefit. And there's there's a harmony of interests. I mean, what we've talked previously about the uh, caricatures there are of uh, self-interest. And yet another one is that uh, if, if you're benefiting, somebody else is losing, that there's a kind of zero-sum game mentality and I, mean, I think there's a lot of reason to think that that's not true, that there are a lot of win-win relationships. And that's true in uh, present day society. It's true when you're interacting with other people who already exist, but there's no reason to think that that same idea wouldn't extend in principle to uh, future people. So um, that if we're doing something that benefits ourselves now in, in an authentic sense, in the sense we're, doing, we're acting to benefit our own long range interests, uh, there's no reason to think that wouldn't work to people's benefit in the future. And I mean, McCaskill himself at one point in the book, uh, when he's talking about progress and the importance of progress, he talks about how past generations, they couldn't even conceive of the kind of progress that we have today. But then you know, it's worth thinking about whether uh, is he now not asking us to think about the needs of the future in, and, and as, we'll see in, as we'll soon see, He's asking us to think about the needs of the very, very distant future. And yet, by his own admission, the people in the past have a hard time thinking about what the people in the future need. And if, uh, if people in 19th century or the 18th century had thought about uh, our needs you know, to the exclusion of their own interests, they'd be thinking, well, well, we better make sure that the horse and buggy supply is uh, preserved because then you know, people in the 21st century won't have transportation. Um, and you know we better not use too many horses now for our own transportation purposes because I mean I don't know if anybody would actually think that but it's it's uh, well I mean there, he gives an example that there are... like it which is in effect oh we could have stopped climate change if we weren't using fossil fuels a hundred years ago and if we didn't do that, that we would have not had an industrial revolution a progressive society and that's why it's so important to think about the future in terms of principles not in terms of trying to solve each and every concrete policy because when I pursue my interests, the fundamental things that are to my interest are knowledge and you could put it different ways, technology, economic prosperity, um, capability is another way of putting it. And so if I'm, if our generation pursues our interests by protecting freedom and then creating a lot of knowledge and a lot of prosperity, that is exactly what creates the ability to solve future problems and make life amazing in the future. And so the more that we're cutting ourselves off from uh, knowledge and the more that we're cutting ourselves off from wealth, the, it's actually at least we should be on the premise that it's kind of um, 
very likely to be true that the best that we're helping future generations, whereas we cut if we hold back from that, we could be harming future generations. I mean, the wouldn't you say, Don, that the uh, kind of most obvious illustration of this is, and it's not the only one, but the most obvious illustration of this is the way in which, you know, if, if the parents do well and leave a lot to their children, then the children are going to do better. And I mean, if that same pattern occurs uh, and reoccurs in the future, you, you, you get it happening on a large scale. Um, I wanted to also say something because about another admission that McCaskill makes where, where I think he's right that, I mean, he says sometimes people will, some of the thing, the ways in which we've benefited from past generations uh, concern achievements that were made with a specific view to the future. One that he mentions is the U.S. Constitution. And I mean, I agree there. It's, it's not just, uh, you know, I think the founders were, were thinking about what future uh, presidents and future American citizens would do and how they needed to structure the Republic in order to ensure the, you know, continued survival of the blessings of liberty. Um, but it's not as though they were doing that with the mindset that the system they're going to set up with the Constitution is not going to be uh, of, of benefit to their own generation. They think that a system of liberty, a, Repub a Republican Constitution is going to be good for them and because it's good for them, it's going to continue to be good as long as it's passed on uh, to the future. And uh, they're looking there at like, what do human beings need as human beings, whatever generation they're living in? And we're living as human beings in this generation. And if it's good for us, it's going to be good for people in the future. Okay, well then let's uh, look at some of the details of McCaskill's, uh, McCaskill's view, some of the arguments, some of the concrete uh, policy proposals he has. So <clears throat> just to start outlining his argument, um, he adopts a view that, and I think we're going to talk about this in greater detail later, that morality is essentially about treating the interests of others as equal to your own. Um, so for example, if I'm deciding what to do, uh, let's say with respect to planning this podcast, the moral thing to do would be to count Don's uh, preferences, Ben's preferences, and my own each, um, each, there we go, each equally, uh, not prioritizing my own ahead of either of theirs. And then if you think at a kind of society wide, kind of thinking about uh, how the, the moral course of action, um, I have to think about the interests of all people um, or all affected people, uh, people affected by my actions as no more important than mine. Um, um, <clears throat> so, but, taking this. By the way, just yeah. to explain why that other image came up, this isn't this is an idea he gets from Peter Singer, and we'll talk more about Singer later. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the, what's what's somewhat, I, I guess, not novel from um, McCaskill or from the long termists is that future people count in this calculation. Um, also, uh, and it's not future people like um, someone is planning to have children and they're calculating their uh, life plans based on that. It's any people, any potential people existing into the indefinite future uh, count towards this calculation and they count the same um, as presently existing uh, people. So in now, in certain ways, they might actually count more, not individually. They'll count the same individually, but the future is so vast and the future populations are so fat, vast, um, potentially they are, that when we're thinking about how present actions affect the future, it's, you know, the human population is, what, 8 billion presently, is thereabouts. Um, and you're thinking into the indefinite future, you're thinking of, the number of people in the indefinite future is many orders of magnitudes greater than the present population. So pretty quickly, their interests swamp the interests of anybody um, presently existing. So that's kind of the, the basic way. Big, the way he puts it. The future is very big. Yeah, the future is very big. Um, so that's kind of the way he's 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 thinking about. Um, you know, that's that's the long termism. That's the ism to it. So. Uh, so we wanted to look at some of the 
concrete proposals he makes in the book and you know, try to understand them both from why is he saying this from the long-termist perspective and then you know what what we think is um, wrong with that I think the first one we wanted to talk about we already hinted about it hinted towards it a little bit is rapid decarbonization um, so he essentially argues that it wouldn't be too big of a sacrifice for present people um, to rapidly decarbonize and he says there's present presently there's costs associated with uh, fossil fuel use pollution and global warming um, but that the rationale for the rapid decarbonization is that our present use of carbon is going to it's his concerns aren't just global warming some of them are a little uh, strange like he hypothesizes how society would recover from a total collapse and he has this kind of view that part of their recovery would require easily accessible fossil fuels so we shouldn't use them up now because you know in a million years there might be a societal collapse and once they're ready to recover another million years later they'll need all the easily accessible fossil fuels um so i know don you've you've thought a lot about uh, environmentalism and use of fossil fuels so uh, what is your take on on this yeah i mean this material in the book i mean really hit me across the face because this is I, I worked with alex epstein from the center for industrial progress for a number of years and so this is a, an issue that i know really well and it was a stunt so the whole pretense of this book is we're going to be really scientific about how we're thinking about the welfare of you know people across an infinite kind of time frame um and yet the kind of sloppiness and really complete disregard for the impact of what he's proposing on real human beings in this section so it's yeah we're going to rapidly decarbonize what would that actually mean for people today in a world where 80 percent of the energy and growing that we use comes from fossil fuels where fossil fuels are so much more cost effective than any of the alternatives and there's just kind of this oh we can just replace it with wind and solar never mind that we're already seeing a situation in europe where like people like we're not talking about people maybe dying from storms in 100 years or people like in you know uh, let alone something like a million years from now we're talking about people who are very likely to die this winter because they cannot afford to heat their homes and so to just treat this as yeah obviously it's a great thing to get rid of fossil fuels rather than saying like at most what his argument could amount to is it's going to be horrible and tragic to decarbonize today but we have to do it because people a billion years from now will benefit but he doesn't make that argument he just treats it lightly and dismissively as yeah obviously just take away energy and we'll probably replace it with something no big deal and so that to me casts a, if, like if that's how he's arguing on something where the where the i think the facts and data are super clear cut then when he's speculating about the future of AI technology and things like this, I, my view is I don't trust anything he says. Okay, so let's talk about the AI issue then. So one of his concerns about the future is um, some sort of artificial general intelligence being created and then um we lose control of it and he's particularly concerned about this because of what we were talking about at the beginning the entrenchment of values so um he he talks a lot about um the entrenchment of uh of the view that um slavery is morally good or um, um permissible and he makes a big deal about how much effort it took to unentrench that that value so he's very concerned with value entrenchment bad, bad values becoming entrenched and he thinks that artificial general intelligence is a um a possible way in which bad values be, could could become entrenched so he points out that software can outlast hardware um so if you have some kind of uh some kind of uh, software system with bad values entrenched in it, it'll be difficult, if not impossible, to to un, undo this. Um, he, you know, some of the things he's worried about it that it would want to take over and control us, eliminate us, 
Um, he's worried that an artificial general intelligence might oppress uh, digital living beings, um, living beings that are in some sense just software, uh, which nonetheless would have moral uh, moral worth. So I know Ben, you had a few comments you wanted to make about the digital beings this. are what he's worried about in case human beings have become extinct. Um, so uh -huh. let me just add a few qualifications on what I'm about to say. The first is that we get we have to understand what exactly he's talking about here. There's artificial intelligence, which you know many of us have, uh, you know, running on our email programs to make sure that we don't get too much spam. Um, mm -hmm. it, there are various things people call artificial intelligence, which are you know complicated algorithms that use machine learning in order to make predictions and therefore uh, better attain our goals. He's talking about something called artificial general intelligence, which is something that does not exist yet, something that people think might exist. And the general part there is what's doing the work. It's 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 no longer delimited to one specific programming goal. It's it's got the capacity to learn and do anything. And so much more like an actual human intelligence, except artificial and, you know, uploadable to the cloud somewhere. So this is really something more like Skynet um, uh, from the Terminator that he's talking about, I think. And um, I'll say, like, I do think that there are legitimate worries that that people can have about this, what artificial intelligence can do. I mean, there's interesting, real stories about the way in which the algorithms on social media have uh, uh, pushed, you know, sick people in the direction of even worse sickness because of the way they um, follow, you know, what the computers recommend. But, uh, and, and so there's, there's, there are questions here that need to be answered and problems that need to be solved. And to that extent, the tech people who are working on these problems are working on something big and important and, and interesting. Um, however, <laughs> the, the, the way that artificial general, in, general intelligence is, is, is worried about and debated about and I know I'm going to get a lot of tech people writing hate mail to me because of this. It, I find it completely bizarre. Uh, I find it, and I know that McCaskill himself is going to say, well, yes, it's, it is just a low probability outcome, but if it happens, it'll be really bad. And we'll talk more about that probability issue later. But um, just in principle, I find the, the worry completely bizarre because on the one hand, it relies on, uh, the thing about intelligence that's so powerful, I mean, it's supposed to be dangerous because, no, this is like real human intelligence, except it's super powered by computers and therefore it can do anything. The thing about intelligence that makes it powerful is its generality. But then the assumption is, well, what if the bad values get programmed into this powerful general intelligence? But if it really is general in the way that human intelligence is, then it's the kind of thing that can overcome its programming. And there's no reason to assume that that kind of system would function in the deterministic way that the current, uh, the current AIs do. So I think that the, uh, the idea that intelligence can be rendered in a deterministic way where these values get programmed in, these bad values get programmed in, like it's not just Skynet, but it's, it's like Hitler's Skynet. Uh, it, this to me betrays a number of philosophic prejudices that I think are otherwise likely to be found in the tech community, prejudices in favor of materialism and determinism and skepticism about free will. And I think this comes out in other aspects of the long-termist view that we're going to get to later. Um, but it's, I, I just find it, uh, and I, I've like, I've, I went to a conference once with a bunch of um, effective altruist people and I, I expressed my utter, uh, perplexity and indignation that they were even spending time debating about this, but I'll, I'm just, I'd like to re-ratify that sentiment right now. <laughs> so um, now in fairness to McCaskill, not every worry about the future he has is uh, science fiction dressed up as philosophy. Some of it is a serious concern. So he's concerned with avoiding engineered pathogens in the future. So as far as I uh, am aware, there's still a plausible hypothesis that the COVID uh, virus might have been um, either engineered or ac natural, but accidentally released. So that's a realistic worry. Um, 
the threat of nuclear great power nuclear war is not a uh, not a far out um, uh, fantasy uh, worry Especially these days. And uh, he's, yeah, right. And um, also, he's a, he's a concerned about technological nation, which is something uh, something we uh, view we might share, but for for different reasons. Um, you cut out there for a second. Uh, you said technological stagnation, right? Stagnation, yes. Technological stagnation, so that we could uh, technological progress could grind to a halt. Now he's concerned about that because um, you know each year uh, of progress we lose is magnified uh, into the future um, as since technology it gets more technology. So you can a lost year now turns into hundreds of lost years, you know, in the future. Uh, to future generations. So, um, <clears throat> so Don, I, I know you had a, a few things to say about the more realistic problems um, as concerned uh, McCaskill's take on them. Well, I'll just make one point because I think it really just builds on something we said earlier, which is like, these are real problems. They're really hard to think about and solve in many ways. Um, and But the issue is his framework makes them harder to think about and harder to solve because you're trying to think about the particulars into the infinite future rather than how do we actually secure ourselves safe from nuclear war today and what are the kind of principles that should govern us and so i think the the main issue is yeah he's raising real issues but the way to grapple with them is to think what does our self-interest require today and then we can think about the fundamental solutions so i don't know what the particular solution is going to be to something like you know um bioengineered diseases or to stagnation if that's even uh, if that's like a real phenomenon and something to be worried about except that the fundamental solution is going to involve all right are we protecting the rights of individuals so that they can use their minds to solve problems through reason and that gives you kind of a starting point and starting framework whereas um I, I don't know if we're going to get to it later but maybe one of you guys could just give people a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of calculating that he does that to try to like analyze some of these problems because i think that like it it's hard otherwise for the audience to get like what exactly how he's approaching kind of what should you do about these things And one of the things I think is interesting, which he almost notices himself, I think, but not quite, is that the worries about such things as uh, uh, AGI and 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 any of the other problems that have to do with our technological development, including uh, uh, climate change, including engineered pathogens. I mean, these are all different ways of worrying of of having the Frankenstein worry that some somehow our science is going to get out of our hands and come back to bite us. But then there's this other worry he mentions about technological stagnation. And you kind of can't assign both equal priority because if the thing that's going to come after technological stagnation is people worrying about our technological dynamism getting out of control. So you, you can't really have it both ways. And then when you're calculating probabilities, it's going to make it very difficult to decide which one you should care more about, given that the courses of action that you need to correct one rather than another are going to be uh, in tension with each other. Okay, good. Let's, um, I know we want to talk about some of the, the big picture problems for long termism. So I, I want to start with one I have, and I don't think this one is, I don't think you have to be a philosopher to have this sort of worry about what's going on in his book. So the book is about um, taking into account the uh, the preferences of people in the indefinite future. And um, he kind of makes this argument. So um, some of you have taken um, kind of a, a philosophy class might have heard the following kind of argument. Um, if you're walking if you're going on a walk in your neighborhood and you see a drowning child um isn't the morally right thing to do to save the child and haven't you done something wrong if you keep walking and ignore him and then the argument will say well it doesn't really matter that he's right next to you if you could do something tr similarly easy you know you just have to reach into the pond and save this kid if you could do something similarly effortless to save a person uh at risk of death on the other side of the world, 
what does geography have to do to your moral thinking? And McCaskill says, yeah, well, same thing about time. Um, it doesn't matter how far away somebody is from you. It also in space, and it also doesn't matter how far away from you they are in time. So the the kind of not particularly philosophical, but I still think important thing to say about this is there is an important difference, which is that somebody far away from me in space on the other side of the country, they they exist. They're an actual person alive right now um people in the future don't matter the way that people in the present do because they don't exist they're not even a thought in someone's uh, a serious thought in someone's mind the way a, a, a couple with that's expecting a child might think about the you know that doesn't quite exist yet but they still think about it I mean, we're talking about people a, a thousand or a million years in future in the future um and he, he never really seriously answers that kind of question like what why should someone who doesn't exist count for your moral calculations um at one point he, he even says that the joy a person will feel in the future is no less valuable than a presently existing person's joy and you know by contraposition uh um you could say well then doesn't wouldn't you have to say that suffering of person in the future suffers is no less bad than the suffering somebody presently experiencing is is bad um so ben i know you wanted to tie this issue to some problems about agency that come up in in mccaskill's yeah, reasoning i mean you're right that he never really explains why the future matters so much uh but it in part, that's, I think, because he's he's presupposing a whole framework, a whole philosophic framework about ethics, where he assumes agreement already with his audience. And this is the, the consequentialist view that what's morally significant about your actions is their consequences. Uh, and uh, your actions have consequences in the future. So that's why the future matters, in effect. And, and we'll say a little more about that later. Um, because it's, I mean, we put the picture of Singer on the, on, by mistake earlier and, and, uh, Singer's the kind of granddaddy of today's effective altruist consequentialist movement. And that's where he's getting a lot of this from, but yeah, when another part of, uh, another argument that he makes that's similar to the drowning child in the pond argument, Mike, is, is the one that he makes, um, uh, another kind of analogy, uh, to the, the broken teenager. Yes. He's, Sorry, the broken the broken bottle is that is that what you're thinking? Um, well, that's an, that's yet another one. But um, the foolish teenager analogy is that, like so you're you're 16, 17. You have your whole life ahead of you. Um, you could be like apparently McCaskill was when he was a teenager, and you can go around um, urban climbing and taking unnecessary risks. And when you think about it in retrospect, it's really irrational because you could lose so much. Uh, but it seems fun at the time. And he's saying the human race is the same way that we're in effect in our teens and we've got our whole life ahead of us and we could do things right now that seem a lot, seem like a lot of fun, uh, like using fossil fuels and, um, you know, building dangerous AI programs or whatever. And, uh, but that might end up endangering the whole life that we have left to live. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like a Plato's cave argument. We're stuck here in this cave and we don't realize that uh, there's this whole world beyond us. And uh, so, but just like with Plato's cave, there's a, there's a, there's a big, uh, there are some important metaphysical differences that he's ignoring. Um, and it, it relates to what you were saying, Mike, about, well, the future doesn't exist yet. And so there are important differences between the short term and the long term of an individual human life and the short term and the long term of uh, a hum of the human race. Um, notably, whereas when you have a human life, which is spread out over decades, you still have a single entity uh, that endures through that lifespan and who makes decisions and who, who formulates goals and acts from values with, with the view to attaining those values. And I know that there are um, there are philosophical perspectives that McCaskill is drawing on, 
um, that try to minimize that. I mean, he's a big fan of Derek Parfit, who thinks that the individual, uh, it really is just a bunch of time slices. And so there's not that much of a difference between the relation between ourselves now and our future selves versus our generation now and future generations. We could talk more about what's wrong with that perspective later if we wanted to, but I think most people will get the idea that no, there's a there's a individual who lives their life over the course of time. They make decisions, and they're the ones who experience that lifetime. As opposed to, there's no individual that survives over the course of generations who sort of embodies the collective consciousness of the race, uh, and therefore is able to act over the course of time in order to achieve goals and values in the future, uh, and. One way to see that is to think about how, look, the consequentialists are allegedly worried about the consequences of our actions in the future, for the future. But because the, there isn't this enduring entity who persists over time and makes decisions and is aware of what he's doing, um, it's also the case that the consequences of our actions for the distant future are not really consequences for our actions. That is, you know, we can do something that affects real individuals today, uh, and then they can make choices of their own, which affect other people. And down the road, you have more choices being made and more impact in the future. But at each stage where you're talking about a new generation of people and a new individual person, they're all making decisions themselves and they have they have agency themselves. And I mean, there's a, this is why I was saying before that there's a there's a kind of philosophical prejudice against free will coming out in different aspects of of this movement because it's as though we here in the present are the only ones who have a choice and that nobody in the future gets to make a choice but in fact they do and that means that when the bad things we're worried about happening in the future happen um i mean there may be indirect ways in which we influence it but not in a direct way uh and uh, that's especially because of the fact that the people who don't exist now, who might exist in the future, it's not like they're 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 out there in some kind of platonic realm waiting to be born, and it's 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 a foregone conclusion that they will be born, and now it's just uh, how are we going to impact them? Because of course, the choices that we make now and the choices that our children make in the near term future will determine which people end up being born and whether they end up being born. And this is something McCaskill himself acknowledges, so that there's no determinate future. And therefore, there's no way to compare the consequences of your actions in uh, one kind of action on that future uh, versus different actions on that same future, because the different actions will create different futures. And you know, he he comes up with ways still of weighing uh, those alternatives that are, I think, not very convincing. But we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, there's there's some real problems about uh, diminishing the agency of individuals in the future that I think. Are endemic in any kind of consequentialism, but you especially see it here. Yeah, just briefly, I mean, it, what essentially amounts to is he doesn't position us as teenagers. He, in effect, positions our generation as like the grown adult, and everybody that follows is going to be senile and helpless, and therefore <laughs> we're the only ones who have the power yeah. to decide how they're going to turn out. And that's just like insanely wrong, particularly when you think about the very likelihood that. We should expect future people to be so have so much more knowledge and capability than we have today with which to solve their own problems. That's a really good point. So, Mike, so I think the, uh, uh, we probably should skip the, uh, yeah, the, so the next was, section. Was, in the interest of time. I was going to say the, the other major problem we wanted to talk about was McCaskill's use of possibility considerations and probability calculations. I think we're going to save that for Clubhouse. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can join us afterwards and we can talk about that on, on Clubhouse. So I think the next uh, issue we wanted to talk about is the connection between uh, long-termism and effective altruism. And the, we've hinted at this in various ways. I think we want to talk more directly about the roots of all of this in uh, Peter Singer's work and utilitarian consequentialism. I think we have, yeah, there we go. We have some slides. So um, for those of you who don't know, Singer is a uh, major, he's still around, so 20th, 21st century uh, ethicist. Probably you've heard of him for one of two reasons. Uh, one is the, uh, the effect of altruism that he advocates, which encourages people to... Um, maximally sacrifice to the point of uh of 
diminishing he wants us to, utility. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he he wants yeah he wants us to give up to the point where giving more is to is uh, it, it causes ourselves more harm than it does good for some someone else. Um, <clears throat> and you might have also heard of him as a kind of founding father of the modern animal rights uh, um, um, movement. He has a book called um, Animal Liberation, I think it is. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a kind of like utilitarian consequentialist way of thinking about uh, animal rights that traces back to him. So the suffering and pleasure of animals has to be uh, taken into account in your uh, more in your thinking. Um, according to Singer. Which, so, just as an aside, comes up in this book, too, that we've been focusing on yeah. the consideration of people, but he brings in the pain and suffering of animals, and we're supposed to, like, think about how will this do for fish and birds, and, is, you know, is, how much should we weigh a fish's suffering versus a human's? This is so hard. So that's definitely... In and the, the future animals, too, right. obviously. No, right. they, but there's an easy answer, and you just count their neurons. Right. This is McCaskill's answer. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Singer. Um, uh, so in Singer's way of thinking about morality, morality is all about counting the interests of. Uh, let's just, for simplicity, stick to people. Counting the interests of all people equally. So I uh, earlier I, I uh, summarized the child in a pond argument, and what he's trying to get us to do in giving us that argument is um, recognize, uh, be consistent on certain moral intuitions he thinks his audience is going to share. So if you have the kind of gut reaction that saving a drowning child at, at minimal cost to yourself is morally obligatory, he wants you to be consistent with that kind of reaction by extending it across um, space. So if you could give $5 to, um, uh, what's it called, Oxfam, and they can use that $5 to uh, feed someone who's starving to death in a distant place, you're morally obligated to do that. And then he gives the further argument that, you know, there's really no breaks on this obligation to keep giving $5 here, $5 there, until it gets to the point where Giving a further five dollars is going to make yourself worse off than it'll make someone else better off. So then you, you become um, uh, your giving actually diminishes the total amount of happiness in, in, uh, as a collective sum. Um, so the effective altruist movement kind of comes out of this. It takes the singer way of thinking about morality as uh, as given as 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 dogma, and then it but then it says. You know, um, what's not a good guide to doing this is just kind of uh, following your empathetic, sympathetic emotions. Um, what you have to do is be really thoughtful and calculating about, given my personal um, capacities and what I enjoy doing, like what's the most effective way for me to, to do the most giving? Um, you know, so they'll, what they'll do, what people in this movement will do is rate charities for efficiency. Um, individuals might, so, so some of the kind of life paths these serious effective altruists take are, well, I could work in a soup kitchen and help a small number of people, but I just happen to be super good at math and numbers. So instead I'll get a finance job, make millions of dollars, but I'll give it all away except for, you know, 70 grand a year enough to live on or support a family on give away millions of dollars. Um, people in tech, uh, there's, there's a sub group of people in tech that kind of do that kind of thing too. Um, yeah, and just, uh, I think it's really important to get, the, the call is not just that you sacrifice the money, it's that you sacrifice the career you want. And so Singer will talk about, I had a student who was passionate about philosophy and said, well, I'll go work on Wall Street instead so I can give away money. So it's like you're, you're not allowed to take into account what you want to do or the money that you earn. Yeah, un, but I, I think un, unless doing so would in some way uh, uh, destroy your ability to, to get those earnings. So if you're just, so if you were so miserable in um, finance that you just couldn't get up in the morning and go on and, and keep earning, I think it, 
anyway, the, I guess we don't have to get into like the psychological nuances of, of living up to this. Um, so, so long-termism you could think of as just the sort of latest, um, it's only been around for a while, so I don't want to say exactly fad. You can't tell something's a fad until it ever runs its course. Um, but it's kind of the latest, let's say, twist on this and that it's now taking into account um, not just far off uh, in space uh, persons, but far off in, in, in time. Uh, persons and I know Ben, you have a lot to say about I what's wrong with all say, of it. But what's, like, what's uh, wrong with uh, it. Um, both <laughs> in content and approach, and the, I mean, so I think it is very important that that this that the long termist view is in 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 many ways, it is just a kind of straightforward application of Singer's framework. If consequences matter, well, then you've got to look at the long-term consequences. And if the, the, the impact on people's happiness or suffering is what matters, then look at the people in the distant future. Uh, but then if there's something wrong with that framework, uh, there's there's a lot that's then going to be wrong with this application. And there's a lot to say about what's wrong with the framework. I mean, there's just the, the kind of foundational assumption of the whole consequentialist uh, view that morality is basically about uh, social relationships with other people, and that it's an impersonal kind of value where your own interests count equally with regard to everybody else's interests. Morality is about maximizing some kind of impersonal value sum. Uh, and that's such a provincial view uh, in the history of philosophy, to, uh, which is nonetheless then taken as though it is self-evident truth that uh, without any need for argumentation, that it's it's a it's it's hugely scandalous. I think um, you can see that coming out in the way they think about the child in the pond story, because you know there can be perfectly rational, self-interested reasons about why some child in front of you you would have reasons to save. Like if you're the kind of person who won't even lift a finger to help someone who's about to die, do you want to be that kind of person? And and uh, there's lots of reasons why a rational person and concerned chiefly with his own self-interest and how he's going to interact with people in society and live that kind of long range life I was telling you about is going to have reasons to do that, that don't extend to uh, distant strangers around the world. So it's the analogy doesn't hold up. So it certainly doesn't hold up when you then try to reiterate it for future people. Um, there are just, all the I mean, kinds the, of agency problems you, that I mentioned before too. I mean, but yeah. I, I really want to just get in one point in this because I think this is really because the analogy really affects people like they really find it persuasive. But if you yeah. look at what's going on in the analogy, and this is just building on what you said, Ben, it's taking a situation that doesn't involve a sacrifice or at least need not involve a sacrifice and then using it to get you to embrace a worldview that involves a total yeah. sacrifice. So it's, yeah, of course I'd save a child. What would it cost me? And it's like, that's a kid. And then it's now you have to give up everything. And like that, that turn, whatever their fancy philosophy tricks, that can't be right. Yeah, and it's the giving up. The, they they really want you to give up a lot. I mean, the, the tithing is the new thing. So like ten percent of your income, and if you're tithing, then that you're probably still not living a moral life. But at least you don't have to feel super guilty. And people will ask Singer, "Well, how much of your income do you give up?" And he says, "Well, something twenty something percent, and I still should be doing more." And Bill Gates. Uh, who's like the one of the most prolific philanthropists in history, giving billions and billions of his own uh, fortune and pledging to give it away on you know at his death, is is regarded as uh, sort of morally adequate by Singer, uh, but still not living up to his moral potential and still not living a moral life by Singer's own claim. And Bill Gates writes the introduction to the book uh, where, where Singer goes on to criticize Bill Gates for owning a Leonardo da Vinci original, which he could sell uh, and so many other things that he could get rid of. So yeah, the, we're talking about big sack. I mean, he, he has a former student who listened to his lectures and decided to give up one of his own kidneys to a stranger. And his wife didn't want him to do it because what if your own kid needs a kidney someday? Well, but you know, these other people shouldn't count as any less than my own children. And so therefore, yeah, I mean, this is this is some big stuff that he's asking us to give up. And then when you take that same perspective and you apply it to the long term future, which is, again, you know, really big. And there's even more people in the future that you're supposed to think about. And 
uh, the larger that ledger sheet gets of people who are supposed to matter against whose lives your own life is still supposed to count as equal. Well, your own life becomes of increasingly diminishing significance compared to that vast future that you're supposed to be concerned with. And I think that is why um, the following point is really important, which is that I think this long-termism view, this, this book by McCaskill, is, is a reductio ad absurdum of effective altruism, of, of consequentialism in general. It's just, if it seems absurd that you should be concerned about how your actions might cause the robot apocalypse, uh, or that any of your actions of any kind should be evaluated against their impact on people millions of few years in the future who might not even be born, um, there's something that's gone wrong with your system. And I think that I think that even a lot of effective altruists realize this. They, they see they see this is not good PR, McCaskill. And yet McCaskill really is applying uh, their own principles in a in a straightforward and logical way. And uh, when you when you get to a conclusion like this, if you don't step back and say maybe there was something wrong with the premise that I started with, there's you're not doing philosophy honestly. And the premise that it starts with is, is this assumption about impersonal value and morality is necessarily about treating yourself equal to every other person. And you know, it's interesting, Mike, because you were talking about how part of what's supposed to make the effective altruism movement distinctive is, well, there, I mean, calling it effective altruism implies there's all this other altruism that hasn't been effective, right? And the way they usually characterize it is, well, people are too emotionalistic when they when they make their charitable giving decisions. They, they go with what feels good, with the things that they see immediately in front of them. And they're not being rational. They really need to be rational and calculate the necessary means to the end. And, and that means don't give it away to, you know, a charitable organization in your community that supports the arts. Give it away to buy mosquito nets for starving, dying children in Africa or, um, you know, worry about AI. But uh, when it comes to the foundational premise that the whole thing gets started with, that, well, morality is about treating your life as, as equally important or unimportant to every other person who might ever be born, that they don't have any rational defense for. And that's by their own admission. They say, that's the intuition that you've got to accept. That's the emotional starting point. And I mean, Singer is explicit about this. Uh, yeah. he, he says uh, in various places that intu intuitions are indispensable at the foundations of ethics. And yet uh, a, a group that is so... Uh, animated about how rational they are doesn't bother to apply rationality to its own starting points. Now, in part, that's because they don't think they can. They don't think that there are uh, rational arguments you can give for foundations. And we could have a much longer discussion about why they're wrong about that. But um, I, I do think the whole structure of argumentation here should point out that this is, this is where philosophy has gone off the rails. Yeah, it, it's interesting. There's a, there's a review of, uh, of McCaskill's book by... Um... Scott Alexander, who uh, used to blog at Slate Star Codex, and now he's blogging at Astral Codex, uh, Astral Codex Ten. He's a kind of popular popular blogger in this rationalist movement, which is a kind of broader movement related to effective altruism, but not not the same thing. Alexander accepts all of these foundational premises, I think. He's not an effective altruist, though, and in his review of um, McCaskill's book, he kind of recognizes that, yeah, I mean, McCaskill's taken these premises I, uh, I accept and shown that they lead to long-termism, but then he gets frustrated with the philosophical reasoning, and he says, my reaction is to throw away philosophy and keep my assumptions. Um, which kind of comports with your describing the root of all of this as a sort of emotionalistic attachment to um, to these you know these intuitive sort of intuitive uh, first principles that these are not these are not irrational um, these are not rational conclusions and you know, really it's those even to people who see the reductio it's they'll their the reaction is to reject the, the deductive method that leads to it not the starting points uh okay
Okay, so where are well, we're right at three o'clock. Um, ben, Don, did you have any last uh, points you wanted to make before we uh, log off? No. Take that as well, a no. Okay. Say, so, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say one last thing, which is that it's it's one of the things I find particularly tragic about this book as a uh, artifact of contemporary philosophy is, is not just that it's, it's reached this seemingly absurd conclusion about worrying about, you know, how, what are we doing to maximize the chances for space exploration beyond our galaxy and whether or not the robots will be in charge when they do it. It's not just that sounds weird and therefore crazy and that's the sign that something's gone wrong. What's especially tragic about it is that think about, I mean, if you want to worry about, if you're going to worry about stagnation in our, in the development of human knowledge and technology, I mean, what kind of sign of, is this of the stagnation in the humanities uh, where there's this field that philosophers have occasionally been involved in call, called ethics. Ethics is the field they usually trot out to explain why they're relevant to life. When they need to justify their funding, they say, well, we answer real life questions about about what is right and wrong and what it is to live a good life. But then this is what they give you. What's especially absurd here, what especially makes this a, a reductio of so many assumptions in contemporary philosophy is that it's, it's now removed ethics uh, completely from the important discipline of finding principles that we need to live our lives today to make our lives better over the course of a few decades. What is it to become a good and happy and flourishing person? And there's there's no advice here for this. There's no guidance. I mean, you, you sometimes hear uh, philosophers criticized for engaging in lifeboat ethics where they're you know, talking about strange hypotheticals about what to do in a weird situation where suddenly your life is at stake. I mean, if, if, if hypotheticals they ask about actual lifeboats in our actual world are bad enough, long-termism of the kind that McCaskill is doing is something like a uh, lifeboat problem on steroids. And they're like genetically modified AI enhanced steroids. This is the way that I would describe it to use some of their own lingo. Okay. Thanks. And thanks, Don. Um, We'll continue this conversation momentarily on Clubhouse. So if you want to talk about some of the things we didn't have time to get to, you can uh, join us there. And uh, I think all three of us will be able to make it um, today. Uh, if you're interested in um, more of our perspective or uh, objectivism's perspective on some of the issues we talked about, we have some recommendations for you. Uh, first is the ethics of emergencies by Ayn Rand, where she talks about lifeboat scenario type ethics. Um, it's a first resource. The second is a lecture given this past summer at uh, Ocon by Greg Salmieri on reproduction and the objectivist ethics. What's particularly relevant is um, Dr. Salmi Salmieri's uh, discussion of um, the rational basis uh, for valuing fu the future and future generations. Um, we have an essay by our own Ben Baer, Why Scientific Progress in Ethics is Frozen. I think that touches on some of what you were getting at the end of the end of the podcast, Ben. And yeah, that one's another the first essay is the one about what, what's wrong with the assumption that morality is just about relationships to other people and how it's so provincial for people like Singer to be assuming that's all it's about. And also by Ben, uh, why today's ethics offers no real guidance, also relevant to much of what we spoke about today. And uh, finally, Don uh, and your own, your own Brooks book, Free Market Revolution, chapters uh, six and 10 touch on uh, some of the issues that came up in our conversation. Let me say one thing about that chapter, especially since Don is here. I highlighted chapter six because I think it's a fabulous kind of introductory chapter on a rational approach to ethics, a rational approach to self-interested based ethics as a major alternative to the 
wacky effective altruism that we've just been looking at in chapter 10 is about uh, how free market capitalism is the system of technological dynamism, uh, which is very relevant to some of the things we've been talking about today, since if we're, in, if we're interested in progress, that's what, the, that's what we need. Great. Uh, okay, so next week's show is going to be a discussion between Ben and uh, Nikos Zatirakopoulos on the protests in Russia and Iran. So you can join Ben and Nikos uh, next Friday at the, at the same time. Please we, continue. We, it might to not actually up. be Friday. It might be Thursday. Oh, we haven't decided the details yet, but stay tuned. Um, next, next week at some point, date to be determined. You can join Ben and Nikos to talk about Russia and uh, Iran and the protests in, uh, there. Uh, <clears throat> please continue to send us your questions for future Q&A episodes. Uh, you can email us at uh, newideal at aynrand.org to send us your questions. Ben and I will be doing a Q&A episode specifically on free will um, probably in two weeks. Uh, again, date to be determined, but coming sooner rather than Later, this is this will be our first Q and A episode on a uh, narrow topic. So, um, if you're interested in free will, um, send us your questions. We'll uh, we'll answer them. Uh, we'll spend an hour talking about free will, and then probably Clubhouse as well. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Click the bell notification when it goes live, uh, or we post new recordings. Like, comment, subscribe. Um, please do the same on Facebook. If you're watching the recording, uh, be sure to share it uh, to help attract new viewers to uh, our channel. If you have any questions about today's episode, or if you have suggestions for future, future episodes, please send us an email, again, at newideal at ironran.org. We read all the emails, we respond to many of them, and we, we do take uh, podcast suggestions. Okay, thank you all, and I look forward to continuing the conversation on Clubhouse. Bye. Thanks, Mike. See you. See everybody there.